Welcome to the Endo meeting. It is July 26th of 2023. We have guests today, uh, Greg and Ricardo, who are going to be talking about the sandbox that they have created, and uh, and we're going to listen carefully. Hey, yeah, thank you, Chris. So we are already 13 minutes in, so let's uh, maybe get started uh, so that um, we have enough time in case uh, we want to discuss some things afterwards. Uh, so uh, you should be seeing my screen now, I, I believe. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so, um, so this is uh, more of an introduction to uh, JavaScript sandbox uh, that I that, that I created. One of the motivations for this uh, is that it relates to the work that I'm doing uh, on the. Um, shelter protocol that we have multiple contracts, uh, as Greg mentioned, that need to be uh, confined. And the mechanism that uh, we're using uh, currently there is pretty simple, but also it's possible to escape it in a, in a certain way. So the, this is a more comprehensive solution, but it is also a general solution. So you can use it not just for um, uh, contracts uh, in the shelter protocol, but you can use it for, uh, uh, for example, for running a worker in the in the browser and this sets up all the communication layers that you need. And um, another use case that I found for this is uh, if you have some Node.js application, you might want to, for example, load uh, certain parts of it dynamically, uh, for some, some configuration or something, and this allows you to uh, do this. So, um, so this is uh, more of the package information, uh, um, where to find it. Uh, right now, it's around uh, 3,000 uh, lines of code, and uh, the bundle size is uh, reasonably small, I would say it's around uh, 25 uh, kilobytes. Uh, it says per implementation, and that's an important uh, point because since you have support for different environments and various uh, ways of uh, actually implementing the, the sandbox, it might be uh, more than that. Like for example, for Node.js, I think currently it's at around 30, 40 kilobytes, and then for the browser, you have two mechanisms that I'm going to uh, explain in more detail, but you have, uh, you can use just an iframe, you can use just a worker, or you can use a worker inside an iframe. And uh, if you do that and the worker fails to set up, you might fall back into the, uh, iframe implementation. So that means that uh, in that case, your bundle size would be around yeah, like 40, 50 kilobytes. So um, these are some of the goals uh, set for uh, this implementation. So one of them is to be as lightweight as, as possible. So like not to include uh, things that could be than uh, somewhere else, but that don't need to be part of the sandbox itself. So like it relates to one of the things that we were uh, uh, discussing uh, at the beginning of the call in terms of, for example, uh, translation, if you need to um, do something like that, uh, you would need to probably do it outside of the confinement mechanism itself. So, um, because that's not a feature that might necessarily always be required. And um, when I mean lightweight, I also mean in terms of uh, the, the runtime itself. So um, I've tried to do as much as possible inside of the native uh, runtime that there is so that you're not interpreting JavaScript inside an interpreter because not only would that add to bundle size, but also it would 
um, make things uh, slow. And the same thing goes for, um, for example, th there are certain things that may need to be uh, wrapped and then you are not necessarily taking advantage of the native implementation that there is. But uh, yeah, the, the, the goal is keeping that to a minimum. Uh, then um, another goal is to not change the host environment itself. So like when you are creating a sandbox that shouldn't, uh, for example, delete something from your uh, JavaScript environment or it shouldn't uh, change uh, something like, it would be strange maybe if when you load the sandbox, then you find out that you're no longer able to use eval because maybe you're using eval for other parts of your project. So that would be something that uh, should be avoided unless it's unavoidable. Uh, then the third item is uh, native isolation. And what that means is that uh, this is not exclusively a, a pure JavaScript implementation in the sense that it relies on certain features being available on the platforms of the, to provide this isolation, for example, in order to keep the host environment intact and then make it possible that you can use eval outside of the sandbox. And that means that the code needs to run in a different uh, context, or you could use uh, proxies, I guess. But um, yeah, then you have to be careful with that. Uh, so another thing that this provides is that it makes it um, have a layered uh, approach so that you don't have just a single uh, mechanism like for example, blocking eval, but uh, you are also relying on whichever uh, security mechanisms or isolation mechanisms uh, your host environment already comes with. Then um, another goal is being as agnostic as possible regarding the runtime. Uh, this is uh, uh, somewhat in conflict with the native isolation because uh, running on say the browser is completely different than running on Node.js. So there are certain things that need to be uh, runtime specific, but still I think with um, uh, web workers, uh, that's pretty agnostic. Like you can run it in different browsers, you can run it in Dino. It's, uh, quite likely, I think that at some point um, web workers will come to Node.js, so then you can uh, use that, uh, or, or so I hope at least. Uh, so um, then the next item is to um, try to make the um, sandboxed environment general enough that you wouldn't necessarily make need to make uh, lots of modifications to whichever code you want to isolate. So you should be able to take whichever code you have and then uh, without significantly refactoring it, be able to run it uh, isolated. Uh, then uh, the next uh, item as a goal is that you should be able to put things into the um, sandbox. So like, for example, you could call a function, but then uh, you should also be able to have the sandbox uh, optionally called outside, which is a feature that uh, would be uh, useful. Like I have one example uh, now, for example, for what we are doing with Jelonia, which is that sometimes we need to retrieve certain information from the server or we might need to receive um, yes yeah so like one example of that would be getting the server time and then you cannot call fetch from inside the sandbox but you can uh, call something like fetch to be able to retrieve that and another use for this would be if you are 
trying to do some uh, DOM manipulation, you could run like the computational aspect of it inside of a sandbox and then you would call outside to actually uh, transform the uh, DOM tree. Um, then um, another goal is reducing the use of uh, dynamic code. By that I mean that the um, code that is uh, generated by the sandbox or the sandbox itself, so that uh, you should be able to use a sub-resource integrity. Uh -huh. uh, in practice, that doesn't work that well because uh, SRI has uh, some uh, um, rough uh, cases there around the, the edges, so uh, that doesn't work, but especially also if you try to combine that with CSP, uh, there are some issues there, but um, you can mostly define things statically, and if you know exactly what you're running in the um, in the sandbox and then you know exactly uh, what your environment is. In principle, you have caches for everything. That doesn't mean that you can use them uh, usefully in the browser, but uh, in the future, you might be able to. And um, another thing is uh, trying to use everything provided by JavaScript itself and by whichever host environment you are using, be it the browser or Node or something else and not to have uh, um, runtime dependencies that then would need to be vetted and audited. Right now, there are no um, external dependencies apart from the development environment. So like um, YesLint and uh, YesBuild and those kinds of things. Uh, in the future, if there is something that is particularly useful and uh, not too heavy or it is uh, necessary and complex, then there might be some runtime dependencies, but uh, the goal has been to minimize uh, that. And then uh, in terms of uh, non-goals, uh, so um, as I said uh, previously, one important thing is, is taking this uh, layered uh, approach to security, which means that uh, yeah, just relying on one single mechanism and hoping for the best is uh, something that I try to avoid. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, this relates to the host environment and it's that uh, by just uh, running this sandbox, you shouldn't pollute the global namespace. You and uh, when doing research on this implementation, I found uh, many examples of uh, sandboxes that uh, seem to take the approach uh, where you have different known mechanisms of escape and then you try to patch each of those individually and I don't think that that's uh, necessarily the best approach so to try to avoid that. Uh, now I, I realize that in certain situations you might have to end up doing this anyway but if you can find a more general approach I think that that's uh, what you should use and then uh, it might be harder to circumvent. Uh, then, provide a concrete example of what you mean by global pollution. Uh, yes. Uh, so I mean, uh, for example, redefining what uh, the global function uh, constructor does. Okay. Or like adding some special attribute to that that you wouldn't uh, find in a vanilla environment. It, it seems to follow that it's also a non-goal for this project to have multiple contracts in a single realm. Is that the case? Um, so you, you mean that um, by realm, do you mean like having 
like two contracts that are executing inside of the same sandbox that share the same environment. Same, yeah, shared memory of multiple contracts. Um, well, you, you, you could uh, do that when you initialize the sandbox. If you pass it a bundle, you could have like all of them kind of share the same namespace, but otherwise they would be isolated. So the intention is that if the user did have multiple contracts in the same sandbox, it would only that they they do that knowing that those contracts are vulnerable to interference across between each other. Yes. Okay. And and uh, so, so one thing that um, I'm not necessarily against uh, doing it, but I don't know if there is a good way of. Uh, of handling this, or maybe it would be uh, somewhat ugly to implement, uh, is that once you create the sandbox, uh, that's the code that is going to run there. You cannot uh, interpret something else inside of it. Uh, so so you, you, you need to have all the source available at the creation time. So uh, I guess that that might be something you can change. That's very clear. I, I have a clarifying question also. Is it possible to share object references between sandboxes? Uh, no, it is not. Okay. Um, well, I, 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 that's because I haven't figured out um, so uh, the, uh, the best way of doing Still, you wouldn't uh, share object references, but you could use uh, uh, I suppose a structured clone to uh, at least not be able to copy data, so you, you could transfer ownership. But yep. uh, yeah, the, the syntax for using that is not the. Um, so so you, you need to specify those objects uh, separately, and I haven't found a good general way of doing it. But um, as as close as you get to showing references. Yeah, basically copying uh, or transferring, but not direct uh, references between sandboxes. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Um, then, in terms of the things that are in scope uh, regarding uh, those goals, so one of them is isolation. So uh, yeah, this uh, kind of answers the question of um, uh, of uh, references as well. So you have a distinct global scope with uh, its own um, uh, primitives and its own um, object and function and everything there. The data flow is uh, pretty explicit and uh, pretty strict. So also no uh, references uh, lay laying around. Um, then also the blocking of dynamic code execution. So you cannot call function or eval or set timeout or any of these uh, ways you can interpret a string uh, from inside the sandbox. And also how to terminate the sandbox so you can basically create it and then you can uh, end it and that should free up the resources and memories that that was, that was using. Then in terms of things that, that uh, as of now at least are out of scope are uh, basically anything that you do outside of the, um, of the code itself. Um, so maybe it's a good idea if you're going to be running some untrusted code to uh, see that it's not doing things it's not, it's not supposed to do. So anything that is uh, code analysis or transformations or anything like that, you can certainly do, but it's not provided by the sandbox itself. So you would need to do it beforehand. Um, a corollary of this is that uh, this doesn't prevent uh, denial of service. Uh, so like if you execute an infinite loop inside of the sandbox, it will not uh, prevent you from doing that. You could um, have some kind of uh, monitoring for that or some kind of timeout, but 
uh, yeah, that's uh, as good as you can do. And uh, yes, modules, as also as we were uh, talking at the beginning of the call, uh, are pretty challenging because uh, the, the main issue with them is that uh, it's not specified how loaders work and you are not necessarily able to override them. So until that is fixed, I don't really know what a good uh, solution to this issue would be. Uh, so for now, it's also out of scope, uh, but you can do something similar to um, what you're doing, which is um, use uh, some tool to convert uh, ESM code to uh, classic code. Uh, then uh, these are uh, the, the first three are the currently support uh, the environments. Uh, the fourth one is more of uh, an aspirational one, uh, especially when um, when uh, workers uh, become part of uh, more run things. Well, you'll really need a Shadow Realm uh, for the fourth one. Um, you should be able to be fine with Shadow Realm. Uh, what was that? Shadow Realm should uh, allow yeah. you to... Yeah. Uh, to build the fourth one on any JavaScript runtime that supports it. Yeah. Um, so th th this is more of exactly like how um, uh, things are uh, done internally. Uh, I, I try to put some of the most important uh, uh, details, or at least the uh, ones I thought were most important. So the code itself, uh, CAS, or it needs to have, uh, so, so this is what you put inside the sandbox, it has to have some uh, common JS like uh, interface, which uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, that. The reason for the for this is just so that you can uh, call it. Right now, you can only put things in the um, uh, global um, a scope there, so you, you cannot nest uh, things. That's, I guess that's what I meant. That it has to have a follow a flat structure and fun and be functions like that. Um, so that should work with uh, most code, but you might need to write a wrapper for that. Uh, then the yeah, the communication itself between the host and the um, Isolated code is based on uh, on events and on uh, message event in particular. So uh, there's lots of post message. And then in terms of the actually, quick question here. Uh, sorry, um, are, is the goal to be able to synchronously uh, interact with sandboxes or? If, if since you're mentioning post message, that is uh, an async uh, only uh, communication channel. Um, no, I don't think that you that you can uh, do. You you could uh, you you could use a wait if you want to have something um, uh, um, synchronized. So 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 like uh, so like um, that's yeah. actually like, uh, let's uh, skip some. Uh, slides here. So, so this is what a call uh, looks like. So, right. if, so it's uh, promise based. So you could uh, make it look like it's synchronous, but it is in fact asynchronous. Um, yeah, and then uh, I think I was at the different layers. So you have. Uh, at first, something that is provided by the platform that you are using, so that depends on the on the platform. Then you have some hardening of the different globals to prevent you from accessing things that uh, you shouldn't. And then there is a third uh, uh, protection there that he. Uh, thought would be useful, especially if you are not able to. Um, audit the code in advance, and you don't want to uh, parse it to check that it's valid JavaScript. And that is that 
uh, you could escape like this um, uh, with a statement in the sandbox that I'm going to show by uh, um, basically adding however many braces you need um, and then putting code that will then run outside of that scope, um, which by itself would be invalid JavaScript, but uh, since this is a string concatenation, the sandbox wouldn't know any better. So, um, yeah, uh, so, 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 so that's basically adding a random number of parentheses. Uh, and again, this would be useful in situations where you have uh, untrusted code that you don't um, try to check for correctness. So, uh, yeah, I think I already showed this, but yeah, this is what the words look like. So, um, that, that is what would be inside of the sandbox. Uh, then um, more on the multi-layered approach. So when you're running things on a browser, uh, you, uh, yeah, uh, you can uh, have a couple of options. So you can run it as a worker. Um, the downside of that is that you share the same CSP as the parent. So if um, you could somehow escape the sandbox itself and you wanted to restrict the fetch calls uh, that the sandbox is able to make, then you can no longer do that unless you restrict the, uh, the parent origin to, uh, like in, in the same way as the, uh, as the sandbox. So if you want to uh, uh, prevent that, in a more uh, thorough way, then you have to use uh, an iframe. And the, the issue with an iframe is that you have lots of access to things that uh, could by themselves also be problematic. So the solution is you combine the worker environment with an iframe, and then you get uh, both things. And then you can um, have a finer grain control on uh, CSP. And optionally, you can uh, fall back to just an iframe if the worker setup uh, fails. And that also saves you around uh, 20 kilobytes of code because you don't need to include the, uh, just the iframe code. Um, Ricardo, can I have a quick question? Sure. So what happens when the page in which like specifically for browsers, what happens when the page in which you want to execute your sandbox already have already has a set of CSP rules defined? Because as far as I remember, in that case, you wouldn't be able to dictate a new set of CSP rules to sub realms. Am I correct? Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, that that's a good uh, point. Uh, so CSP can only ever be more restrictive. You cannot um, make it laxer. So that me so that means that um, everything that the sandbox uh, is allowed to do, then you should include in the. Um, in the root document. Now, the good news is that the sandbox actually isn't allowed to do very much. So you could have a pretty restrictive CSP, but one of the issues that I run into with this is that you uh, need to have um, uh, at least so far some, you need to have like unsafe eval there or like one of the other unsafes. Um, or else you will not be able to start up the, the sandbox. And then you also need to allow uh, the blob um, um, protocol because that's what the sandbox is. Uh, so yes, you, you have some uh, limitations uh, in terms of what you can do with, with CSP, but uh, I hope that they are not uh, too old too many things you need to add to your uh, CSP to make this work, like that none of them would be a deal breaker, like adding a blob in principle, I think 
you should be able to trust the blobs that you generate yourself on your front end, but um, I realize that may not always be the case. And uh, yeah, similarly, if you use the iframe um, approach, then you need to allow your page to load uh, frames because if you restrict the, the root documents from loading a frame, then obviously that will also fail. Uh, ZB also asks, uh, do you mean CSP or iframe sandbox attribute? Uh, both. Okay. So, so the um, I, I meant which one is getting uh, dynamically updated? The um, the uh, uh, the one that is getting dynamically updated is the one that is inside of the iframe. So, like the iframe uh, has um, CSP when you create it, which allows it to load scripts. And then after the sandbox is set up, that CSP gets updated so that uh, you can no longer evolve scripts. So, so, and so that how do you can... update the CSP from within JavaScript in the realm? You, um, uh, that, that, that's handled by the um, initialization code. So like when you uh, load the sandbox, there, um, it checks. Um, so it, it defines a method to update the uh, CSP. And then if everything got set up correctly, then it updates it. Uh, one last follow-up, sorry for that. But uh, no, that's fine. how does the browser allow changing the current CSP? Are you setting the meta tag instead yeah. of the header? Yeah, well, it has to, be, yes, it is a meta tag. And it has to be a meta tag because uh, this uh, this iframe is, uh, the, the contents of it are JavaScript generated. There is nothing loaded from a server. Um, okay. So yeah, so there, there are no headers to set. But the the meta HTTP equiv uh, fortunately works. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I might got be, it. I might be confusing you here, but um, because I'm looking at the source code simultaneously, and I don't see the meta being brought up in the source code. I do see a CSP attribute. Um, I think, um, okay, let me look at that. Um, I think it's on live. Uh, it's called uh, Titan CSP. So it's Sorry? like live Titan CSP dot TS. Um, I'm I can... asking only because. I have never seen the CSP attribute for iframes before, so that's. Me. Oh, it's not. It's not a. It's not a CSP attribute for i. So you have. Um, so so you create an iframe. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, the iframe has the sandbox attribute. Then mm -hmm. inside of that iframe, you have an HTML document, uh, and then. That document itself is like the sandbox uh, environment, uh, which may or may not contain a worker. And the meta tag is applied to within uh, that iframe, so the document that is in the iframe. OK. Um, that oh, uh, makes sense. Uh, yeah, that looks good. Sorry, I'll keep looking yeah no worries um yeah which then brings us to node.js and uh, this is uh, something that uh, i've tried doing for now but um, 
Unfortunately, Node.js seems uh, like they haven't thought of this uh, use case at all. And um, uh, it seems like, uh, honestly, the best approach for doing this in Node.js is uh, not doing it and then in, uh, using some sort of add-on or maybe just not using Node.js at all. But uh, if you do want to use uh, Node.js, this is maybe how you could do it. So. And Node.js doesn't support uh, web workers, but you have uh, worker threads and you have the uh, VM uh, module as well. And you can combine these two. Uh, so you can use a worker thread to be able to uh, isolate your environment from the main instance that you're running so that you, there you can, for example, block calls to function and so on. And then you can use the VM uh, uh, module to uh, sort of ensure that it's harder at least to access uh, certain things like uh, requiring uh, uh, code. But um, I guess the, the, the main thing with uh, Node is that uh, because they haven't considered this use case at all, uh, things feel pretty uh, fragile and uh, you are one mistake away from having access to the entire machine. Um, so one thing I try to do to prevent that uh, besides worker threats and VM is uh, convert to and from JSON at the boundaries, which is uh, so like when you send a message or when you receive a message, which is uh, perhaps not the most efficient, but it should, if you're careful, I think remove most of the um, uh, references that you may have uh, outside of different contexts. Um, then Pardon. you can also block like, yeah. yeah. We do that in addition to making sure that there's an asynchronous boundary between the reader and writer. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is that it's very easy with Node to have like references passed. And then when you have a reference to say, for example, you have a reference to the um, uh, global uh, module anything. thing, then you can do anything. Once you have anything, you can get anything else. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, basically that's the danger with, uh, with no, I, I try to restrict it as much as I could possibly uh, think of doing, but uh, yeah, it seems like it's like, very like, this is what you can get. You starting yeah. from, <laughs> starting from getting an empty object literal, you can get to the object constructor so you can get from there to the function constructor from there you can call the function constructor and get access to dynamic import for any module of the of, the, of node so yes yeah so 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 that's why uh, if you combine worker threads with node vm uh, it kind of works because you like inside the worker thread you can for example block the function constructor so, um, so then even if you manage to escape the uh, VM uh, module, which is pretty easy to escape, you still wouldn't have access to the function constructor, but you are still able to load uh, uh, modules. So then you have to block that uh, uh, module uh, dot underscore uh, load. Uh, function and you may still have access to the file system. So yeah, basically, uh, we have know this uh, like that. Um, Dino, on the other hand, uh, is uh, um, much saner in, in that regard. And actually, uh, Dino supports uh, workers, so you don't even need any special code for Dino. Um, but um, yeah, th th there are two issues with that. One of them is that it only supports uh, type module workers. It doesn't support um, classic workers, which is fine since you're supposed to pass in a bundle to uh, your sandbox. So it 
it works either way, but uh, the thing with modules is that um, you might be able to load uh, things that you're not supposed to be able to load or something. So, so it would just be better not to have to deal with import or to have a way to define how it, uh, how it behaves. Um, and then uh, another issue is uh, Dino, like if you try to run it right now on Dino, it will not work because there is this um, issue with event is trusted, uh, which is a hard coded uh, check that I do at some locations that I guess I could remove, but um, I reported this issue to Dino and it might get fixed soon, so maybe it can still be used. And th that is that when you use post message, uh, it's trusted, it's set to false, even though it shouldn't in that case, it should only be if you use dispatch event uh, manually. Um, then, yeah, in general, uh, yeah, like uh, I said, uh, you can use workers or, uh, yeah. Um, you might uh, still be able to use only the isolation that you can accomplish with uh, pure JavaScript if you um, um, give up on not modifying the global environment as well. Then how some of the uh, language things are done. So like the global hardening, I, don't want to spend uh, too much time on because it's uh, pretty similar to what SES does. So there is a list of functions that are known to run uh, dynamic code like function, eval, set timeout, and function is a family of functions, not just a function constructor. So those are uh, patched so that you cannot um, run arbitrary code. Then, uh, if some other function comes in uh, future JavaScript uh, spec that is able to do this, then that needs to be um, fixed as well. And obviously, this will affect the global environment. If you change function, then anything that has access to that reference will be affected. Um, sorry to do that. I have a small question. Um, yeah. so just, uh, thinking out loud here. So, um, you said that your monkey patch, these type of functions to make sure that running arbitrary code dynamically is impossible. Um, right. what happens if you try, if you in your sandbox have some sort of access to a document whether it's the document of the, the sandbox itself or not, if you have that, access you might be able to create an ui frame and then try to steal a non monkey patched version of function eval set timeout and so on um am i my is my something correct here uh yeah uh, definitely so if you are um so, so, so uh, what prevents you from doing this is the sandbox attribute and the CSP. So you cannot um, uh, access the uh, top document and you are not able to access the parent document in case those two are different or you're not able to access a new child iframe that you create because all of those things are blocked. But uh, if, if there is some uh, error in the, um, in the browsers that allow you to do this despite uh, CSP, then uh, yeah, you might uh, be able to escape uh, that way. So I'm, I'm, you... assuming, I'm assuming that if you because you would never really know what is the code that you're about to run in a sandbox. That's what the sandbox is for. So if this, the code that is about to be executed in the sandbox has the minimum amount of access to the document of the sandbox itself, I, I assume it would be able to move from there into a new realm. Um, so I, I would, I would, 
think about that maybe. Um, just thinking out loud. If you have like, uh, or, or if you come up with a concrete example where uh, the browser doesn't prevent you from doing that, I would be very interested to hear uh, from my uh, testing and um, of this. It doesn't seem like uh, you are able to do this because you. Uh, so, so on the one hand, you have the um, CSP that is preventing you, and then you also have uh, many restrictions when you're accessing uh, cross-origin documents, and the um, iframe that is running the sandbox is on a uh, null origin, so it's uh, pretty restricted already in terms of, um, of what it is. Uh, has access to, but uh, but uh, again, yes, if, if you're able to um, create a document, then uh, yes, you would be able to escape, which is why actually uh, it's a better idea to run the, the worker inside of the sandbox, because in that case, you don't have access to any capabilities uh, of I creating. Your, your clarification is pretty important here, because um, I think you're correct in your assumption that if the iframe, if the document is within a sandbox iframe to begin with, then I think you're right, and my assumption might be wrong here. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's an important clarification. So we're at the a minute to close. Um, I would love to continue this conversation next uh, at a subsequent meeting, maybe even next week, depending on how full our schedule is. Um, uh, uh, or folks are welcome to hang around, uh, as, depending on. Uh, how I, I can't stay, um, but I think if I was to summarize what I heard is that this is relying on a new realm for uh, providing an, a new environment that you can load code that trusts each other. Uh, and it's relying on uh, the host ESP and um, sandbox null origin to prevent any evaluation from occurring inside that realm, um, such that you're sure uh, it cannot escape that sandbox. Yes, uh, that is correct. Also, um, like another. Um... Um, so, so the, um, and another thing is that you still, so, so, so even if you, if, if you wouldn't have this protection enforced by the browsers, still in theory, you shouldn't be able to get a hold of a reference say, to the document um, uh, object. But uh, if you get it somehow, then um, you- If you, you don't- yeah, if you don't have the host uh, preventing new code execution, uh, as Chris mentioned, you can at least access dynamic imports or uh, things like that to uh, evaluate new code, which runs in uh, in the top of uh, of the realm in the in the in the global. So it would bypass any um, with scoping that you do there. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, um, one trick I know um, Salesforce has used to disable uh, the dynamic imports is to detach the iframe. Um, however, if you detach the iframe, I believe you can't do post message anymore, I'm, I, I think. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh... Yeah, you, you lose the ability to do that, which in, in this case wouldn't work, but I, I thought of trying that. Thank you. Yeah, so in summary, I'm glad that you've wandered into this little room of ours and we hope, and I hope that we can uh, make use of each other's approaches. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, I, I feel like we are covering slightly overlapping but not completely overlapping goals and that uh some of the things that we can that we're doing are useful to each other um yeah 
so I'm gonna I'm gonna call the uh, call this a meeting and hope that we can uh, uh, that we can finish this presentation in a subsequent. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for yeah, allowing me to present and for the um, for the discussion. A question that came up early that I'm just wondering if we if we came back to it uh, is we've got some um, uh, uh, syntactic prohibitions because we can't um, uh, because even with the valuable scripts with with and proxy and direct eval and all those tricks, um, uh, the import expression uh, is still a problem because it re reaches out and, uh, um, you know, it's import expression can still be in a valuable script. And as, as we were saying, it, it imports good. It relies on the host uh, through CSP uh, restrictions. Yeah, so, um, so there, yeah, it, there are some interesting things that we can dig into here in the subsequent meeting. Yeah. Um, so the, I mean, the host CSP only the only browser hosts have CSP restrictions. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay, what um, then for import expressions in particular, if you're using uh, classic workers, then uh, imports are not uh, valid syntax. So that would uh, also import, be prevent it, it, Import expressions are valid syntax. And do you um, give access to module yeah. local powers in, yeah. in, a, in a program construct, in an evaluated program? You can dynamic import. Well, in any case, there's also there. I have questions as well that I'm going to defer to next for to the next time we meet. Like, uh, it's not clear to me what we get what what this sandbox gets from with blocks, um, given that it's standing on top of um, on top of the underlying CSP. Um, so yeah, but I I love to have this conversation um, at a subsequent and 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 also like just. You're, so, you're, you're in a space that is adjacent to ours that is also interesting to us for, for similar purposes. And thank you again, also Greg, for the, um, the, the overview of what you're trying to achieve with this, because I think it also aligns with some of the goals that we have with, uh, with the Endopet Demon and our sister project of Sprightly Goblins is working on a similar problem. Um, there's a very, very high chance that we're going to be able to make use of each other's tools. Uh, like. I, I know yeah. we're using post message for a lot of things. Post message is a great foundation for building eventual send, which is uh, a, a big thing that is orthogonal to the concern of how you create your sandbox. That would be really, really useful for creating interoperability, interoperability and object oriented message passing. Um, I look forward to talking about that too. Yeah, and thank you guys for your work on uh, Endo and SES uh, and um... It, it, it's, it's very inspirational. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>